Hi everyone. So today I want to give you a short kind of a mini lecture focusing on writing your first paper and getting going on the object paper, which is due in about a month from the time that I'll be uploading this video. Um, and this, this uh, mini lecture will help you with both the first and the second paper. So uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about um, how to select an object, where to find objects for this object paper. Um, I'm going to show you a sample paper, which I've also uploaded online on our, uh, in our Google Drive folder. I'm going to show you our rubric for grading in the, in the paper section of this course. So that'll be applied to both the object analysis and the source analysis paper, your final paper. I'm going to talk about good and bad sources, both on the web and elsewhere. We're going to look at the LaGuardia website and how to find peer-reviewed sources. You should be using one or two peer-reviewed sources in each of your two papers, ideally. I'm not technically requiring it in the object analysis paper, but I think a, a solid object analysis paper will often need a little bit of background. Um, maybe not a full journal article, but a decent online source, not Wikipedia. I'll repeat this several times. Don't use Wikipedia as a source that you cite in this class. Just don't do it. I will not accept your paper if you do that. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the biggest question you should always answer in basically any paper you write, especially like a history paper, uh, anthropology, archaeology paper, you should always answer the who cares questions, the biggest paper, uh, the biggest question that you'll answer in a paper. Um, I'll get my face out of the way here. And uh, the first thing I want to talk about really briefly, and I'll, I'll share a video that you can watch on your own, is good versus bad history. Once again, I talked a little bit about bad history last week with some of the megalithic structures that we looked at and the connections, the uh, the crazy TV shows about space aliens that some people make to these places. There are other kinds of bad history, uh, maybe harder to detect and harder to see than some of those TV shows. Um, but let me give you one example uh, of bad history. Um, this is a, a person, I won't call him a historian because he isn't, Gavin Menzies, um, and I have a little bit of his Wikipedia uh, page here for you. And I, I know I told you just now not to use Wikipedia, but to tell you about this guy, I will use it. And I, I get to cheat in this way. You do not. Um, but he's uh, a retired submarine lieutenant commander and author. And uh, his big claim to fame as an author is writing about China in uh, kind of rather disingenuous, poorly sourced ways. Um, and his first and biggest book is called 1421, China Discovering America. And there's an entire YouTube series about bad history. And the very first uh, in that series is dedicated to Gavin Menzies and this book, 1421. So you should know right from the get-go that I hate this book. And so do most other uh, people who know a lot about China. Uh, uh, any professional historian on China will tell you that this book has a lot of nonsense in it. And the really sad part is Gavin Menzies is taking an already extraordinary, amazing, true story and twisting it uh, quite a bit in his book. Um, and so the, the argument he makes about this person, the admiral, the great admiral Zheng He, who lived from 1371 to around uh, 1433 to 1435. It's a little bit fuzzy on his exact death. Um, but he is often called, and this is where Gavin Menzies probably got this idea, he's often called the Chinese Christopher Columbus because he's a great explorer. He's sailing around the Indian Ocean um, and Southeast Asia. Uh, in a large merchant and exploratory fleet, uh, essentially stretching the bounds of the Chinese Empire in the mid Qing Dynasty. Um, and he's a really amazing explorer, a really amazing person. And he's real. Zheng He is real. And he's a very important part of Chinese history. And I have on the map uh, here on the right, roughly the very farthest extent that any historian will accept as the voyages of Zheng He. And it is debatable how far down the coast of Africa he really got. He certainly was in Northern Africa, 
uh, but he may not have actually gotten down to the southern tip of Africa, as this map shows, but I'm being very forgiving in showing you this map of the voyages of Zheng He. Now, Gavin Menzies, our, our author here of this book, 1421, claims that not only, in fact, did Zheng He round uh, the African continent, he also crossed the Pacific and reached the Americas um, and circumnavigated the globe. That's essentially Gavin Menzies' uh, argument, and it is made on virtually no substantive uh, grounds in terms of sources. When you read his book, when you look at it, uh, you see uh, footnotes that point to nowhere, footnotes that point to his own claims or to research that does not exist. Uh, you see claims that are hundreds of years apart, like the uh, presence, if you watch this video, uh, which is, I think it's quite entertaining, you do not have to watch it, but if you want to watch someone get eviscerated in terms of their poor sourcing and poor uh, historiography, uh, you can watch this video. Um, he, he makes claims based on things like the presence of Asiatic chickens hundreds of years later in Central America um, is evidence of Chinese conquest of the Americas. So uh, this is essentially very nearly as much of, as a, of a logical leap as guessing that uh, space aliens are connected to old megalithic structures. There, there's no reason to say that. There's no really, you know, compelling piece of evidence that Gavin Menzies is working from in making this argument. And the sad thing is that, you know, a lot of people have read this book and taken it as uh, true history. So the wrong thing with this picture is that it, it's sometimes deceptive what is out there in terms of reliable historical material, especially for the pre-modern world. There is a lot more room for this kind of guesswork, this kind of haphazard guesswork in the pre-modern world than there is most of the time in the modern world, say after 15 or 1600, because we have so much more evidence uh, in later periods of history and it's easier to interpret. That I'm not saying that ancient history or pre-modern history is harder to do than modern history, that's not the case, but that there are differences in the difficulty. Modern history becomes difficult sometimes because there is so much information that sorting through and prioritizing what really matters becomes difficult. But the real issue here is that Gavin Menzies in this book, 1421, does none of this. And I want you to be able to distinguish quality sources from poor quality sources in this course as you're uh, approaching your papers. So that's something we're going to uh, kind of learn how to do today. Um, the first thing you would kind of get as evidence that Gavin Menzies is not really a reliable person is just by looking here at his background. He, he has no real training as a historian. He has no... Uh, formal education, it seems, as a historian. And so, uh, especially as a, a sinologist or someone who studies China, there's a tremendous amount of background work that you have to do. Uh, you know, many years of language training, uh, often your, you know, your education as a young person, as a child, or as a high school student will not really talk about other parts of the world. You tend to focus on the place you're from in primary, secondary education. Um, and so, uh, you really do need a lot of background to be able to understand the history of lots of different places in the world. And it's kind of clear from his book that Gavin Menzies doesn't have this. Anyway, I'll get off this subject. I'll stop ripping on Gavin Menzies and we'll get into uh, your object papers and we'll get into sources here in a minute. But first of all, what's an acceptable object? What kind of object can you pick? Well, we're making a virtual museum so size doesn't matter, and I've given you some interesting examples here. If you want to study the Sphinx, certainly that's not going to fit in a physical museum most of the time. You'd have to build a structure around the Sphinx, but we can go ahead and put that in. Uh, the caves of Mogao here on the right, which we'll look at later in the term. You could look at a shipwreck in the Black Sea. You could look at the terracotta warriors of the tomb of Qin Shi Huangdi, which we will uh, learn a bit more about later. Uh, maybe in the next week or two. I'm not sure exactly when we're getting back to China. Um, but anything before 1500, really, any object, it could be a castle, it could be a temple, it could be a very big or a very small thing. It could be, uh, you know, something that you could fit in the palm of your hand or something much bigger, and that's up to you. What's more important is that you can write about it in detail. 
Uh, I want you to pick something that you know something about, not just this is a very old sword or something, and I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to tell you about swords in general. That doesn't make for a very useful paper because your sword that you've picked in this example is then not really linked to the history you're writing other than the fact that it's a sword. Do you know who made it? Do you know when it was made? Do you know how old it is? These are important details to have about the object that you're looking at. What was it for? Uh, what was it made out of? Uh, how was it made, et cetera? And I think I already said that, but you should be able to tell us uh, a lot of detail about the object. That's mostly going to go into your museum label because you're going to make a museum label for this thing. It's about a paragraph long. And you should also be able to tell us why the object matters. Why is this thing important? Not just, uh, you know, it's important because it's old. You should be able to tell me specifically what this object tells us about history and why that history is significant. So, for example, with this shipwreck, and maybe this is kind of an easy one, you can tell from the fact that there is this Black Sea shipwreck, it's 2,400 years old, um, that there was active, tra uh, active trade across the Black Sea um, 2,400 years ago, that these ships were fairly large, it had a crew of 15 to 25 people, um, and that they were using both manpower and sails to get around. And then you could also talk more broadly about the impact of trade across the Black Sea. So it gives you this in to talk about the Black Sea trade of 2,400 years ago. Um, and, and so that, that does let you kind of go where you want to with your paper while still linking it back to this shipwreck. And I'm not going to make up a whole paper here for you, but you can see how that could become a broader topic. Uh, with something like the Sphinx, you could talk about the difficulty in building such a thing, its symbolic um, and political implications of this very large object that is also obviously quite symbolic. You could talk about artistic style a little bit with it. Um, and as a re representation of Egypt, you could talk about it as an iconic image that lasts to this day. That's just a quick, dirty explanation of why the Sphinx matters. The Caves of Mogao, we'll get to those a little later, but they're an important site on the Silk Road that shows how Buddhism moved along with objects on the Silk Road. And so that's why we have all this Buddhist imagery in the middle of what is kind of Central Asia. It's, it's very far uh, Western China. Um, and uh, you could also talk about the tomb of Qin Shi Huangdi with the terracotta warriors in terms of the obvious political power and the belief in the afterlife that we see here as these warriors, if you study them a little bit, and we'll get to this later in the term, were there to protect the emperor in his death. Um, so there you go. I've, I've pitched four different objects to you that would all work very well and kind of why they're important. And you should be able to tell me why your object is important too. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how you find information. Um, so we'll talk about finding objects in a minute. But as I said a minute or two ago, you should be probably using one peer-reviewed source would be great for your object paper, and then one or two for your uh, source analysis paper. Um, and it's very useful to be able to use scholarly data databases to find these peer-reviewed sources. So first off, what is a peer-reviewed source? Um, academics like me and like your other professors, when we write a paper and we want it to be published for public consumption, we submit it to any one of, you know, there are hundreds or thousands of academic journals out there. And they don't just take our word for it when we say something is worth publishing. If I want to make an argument about Zheng He, about our Chinese Christopher Columbus from a few minutes ago, they don't just take my word and then publish it immediately. They send it out to other scholars in my field, other sci sinologists, China experts who read it and say, yeah, I know these sources are legitimate. The argument sounds pretty sound. It sounds like it makes sense. Um, and this seems new and worth talking about. And it does appear to me that this is a good faith and compelling argument about Zheng He. So let's go ahead and publish it. Or they come back with notes like, I'm not sure about this argument, or I'm not sure about this source. What do you think about this? And maybe I change the paper a little bit uh, until the editors and the peer reviewers 
who I don't, I don't know who they are. That this is a blind system where I don't know who they are and they don't know who, who I am. Uh, they tell me what they think of my paper and we kind of negotiate until it is published. This is the process of peer review. And it's really important to keeping academic information solid and in a way pure in that it is, uh, it is always scrutinized before it's given out to the public so that multiple experts kind of see things before they are given uh, to the general audience to read. Um, and so what I want you to use in this, uh, in this class is at least a couple of peer reviewed sources over the course of this term. There are several ways to get to them. Um, the easiest way is probably just to go to the library website, the LaGuardia library website. Um, and when you're here in one search, um, what you're essentially doing is searching multiple databases at once, which can be good uh, if your topic is kind of broad or if the thing you're searching for is, is kind of broad, you may end up getting results you don't really want. Uh, like if you're looking at ancient China, and that's all you type in here, you might end up with a bunch of stuff that's not actually about history. It might be scientific articles about climate change or something like that, which can be used by historians, but it's probably not the specific thing you're looking for, a really scientific study of climate or something like that. But to give you just an example, what you should do is you should check articles here. You could also check books if you want to uh, get a book or ebook. And you want to check peer reviewed. So these are scholarly papers. And I'm going to search for Roman coins. I'm going to do it right here for you. And I guess I've cheated. I've done this already and I know it works. Um, and so the first one I get here, I'm lucky, is probably a useful article about uh, the history of Roman coins and the faces that appear on them, the, the figures that appear on them. And it's an analysis of these uh, coins. A big problem is that it's in German. So occasionally you'll find uh, articles that are in the wrong language, but uh, you can still use the abstract and you could translate a little bit of this, of this if you wanted to. And what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to find a full text version of this in PDF. Uh, most of the time it will be in PDF. And uh, for us here, uh, we can find the full text online in DOAJ. Um, and let me see if I can find, here we go, we click full text. Now each journal is a little bit different. Um, and sometimes you get a direct PDF link, sometimes you have to hunt for this full text link. Um, and so here we find it, it's accessible, and here is the PDF, there I found it. Um, so. Yeah, this is actually in English. I don't know why it says it's in German, uh, but this is a wonderful article about Roman coins. I have not read it. I don't know anything about it, but it's a peer-reviewed article. It's from uh, just a few years ago, from 2016, and it's going to be a reliable source on its topic. Maybe not everyone in the field of the study of Roman history, Roman coins, will agree with everything this author says, but this author's work is at least vetted and it is high quality enough that you can rest your arguments upon it. And if someone wants to then attack this, this person's research, they can do that, but your paper will at least be built on one version of an argument of history. And history is an argument, right? It's, it's ongoing. Some things are relatively agreed on, but then later they may not be. Um, so that's how you do a quick search with one search. We also, uh, through, through our, uh, let me reopen that tab. We also, through our CUNY system, through LaGuardia, have access to uh, multiple databases that you can search directly. So if you wanna go to databases here, you can then select an academic subject, which for us would be history, right? So you find history or the humanities, we'll just go with history here. And then there are a couple of databases that it will recommend to you. There are lots of others. We're not going to worry about that. Project Muse is a very good one. Um, the History Reference Center uh, links to EBSCOhost, which is quite good. And uh, Project Muse, let me log in here, is quite good. So with Project Muse, you can just type in a search here. Uh, everything on this is going to be peer reviewed. Uh, all of it, 100%, will be full text. 
So one of the easiest ways to kind of sort down the things you get when you do a general search in LaGuardia might be to try just Project Muse or EBSCOhost. And you would want to always make sure you select full text and peer reviewed wherever you're looking on some of these sites. Muse basically does it for you. If we go for Roman coins again here, uh, we'll get a number of interesting pieces of content. You probably want to select only articles here on Muse. I know I'm going a little bit fast, but you can stop and start this. This is the, the beauty of asynchronous learning is that you can pause this and go back if you want to. And you'll find both full ebooks and articles on uh, on some of these sources or some of these databases like Project Muse. Um, so making history with coins, Nero from a numismatic perspective, sounds like a pretty good source. One thing I'd like to point out with this too, though, is that you will find a lot of things that you probably don't want. Uh, we probably don't care about the crossing of sexual consumer desire in Christina Rossetti's goblin market. I don't think that has anything to do with what we're looking at here. It's probably interesting to someone, but not us, um, not our Roman coin paper. Um, so do keep looking. I know Google has trained us all to look at like the first three or four results in a search and never look any further. But when you're looking at these databases, look a bit further. Be prepared to look through four or five pages of search results and really find the thing that fits you, fits what you need. Here's a, a more generalized source, placing Greco-Roman history in world historical context. And we know that this is probably going to talk about coins because that's what we search for. They'll be in there at least. The late Roman Civil War and the African grain supply. Coins are probably involved here uh, because they're probably related to the purchase of grain, something like that. And I'm guessing here, I have not read all of these. But you'll find a lot of really solid sources. You don't have to leave the house. You don't have to go anywhere through things like our CUNY website, uh, our CUNY library website for LaGuardia and Project Muse, and also EBSCOhost. I use EBSCOhost a little bit less than Project Muse. I also use JSTOR, which I think we have access to. Um, I didn't see it there, but JSTOR is the biggest one, and it can be quite good also. But Project Muse might be your best one for this source or for this course, as well as the LaGuardia website. Um, but anyway, moving along, um, your best practice. And I've covered most of this top of this uh, top of this slide might be finding some info first and then finding a related object. So this is why I've put finding a source ahead of finding an object because it's pretty easy to just Google ancient historical objects of whatever place, China, of Rome, of Egypt, of the Americas, of Mayan civilization. But then finding that perfect article that links up with that object can be kind of hard. So for example, if you're planning to maybe pick out something related to baseball or baseball stadiums, try to find a source that talks about baseball stadiums in general and then pick one to use an example as an example. Because probably when you find this article about baseball stadiums, they're gonna talk about a few of them in detail. They're gonna talk about Wrigley Field or something. And so then you could say, okay, well then I'm, I'm gonna study Wrigley Field as the object because I have this article already that talks about it. Um, so it's a good idea to find the info first and then worry about the object second. Um, before you get writing, I have a sample paper, uh, which I've now put online in our Google Docs folder. This one's a little bit longer than yours, and you're free to write a, a slightly longer paper if you want. It doesn't have to be limited to three pages, but I want three full pages. Uh, and this is something I know students try to game the system. You're going to have a title and your name, and then you're going to be halfway down the first page. Just don't bother doing that. It doesn't. No, you're not fooling anyone. Um, just you know, put your name on it. I've taken the name off of this one. Put the class, put the date, put the title, and then get writing. It shouldn't take more than an inch or two at the top of the page to get all that there. And then fill up three pages double spaced. Uh, and, and that's the minimum. I don't, I don't want two pages with one line on top. That's not three pages uh, that where I come from. That doesn't count as a third page. 
So go ahead and fill out three pages um, and cite your sources at the bottom. I'm not really uh, all that concerned with, with which uh, type of citation you use. If you're on the library website and you find a uh, piece of you know, material that you're gonna source, you can usually click cite this somewhere on that website. Uh, it varies from site to site and you'll be able to get a pre-made citation. There are also citation machines. I'm fine with uh, any, you know, any normal major form of citation, Chicago, MLA, uh, AP, what, whatever you're, whatever you're familiar with, whatever you like to use is fine with me. Um, and maybe I can find a general citation guide uh, to add to our uh, to our folder. But I do like footnotes. I'm I'm kind of a fan of footnotes. If you want to do in-text citation, that's fine as well. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but this sample paper is one that got very, a very high score. I think this got like an A, uh, you know, a strong A, a 95 to 100, something like that. Uh, and you can see here at the very end of the paper, they have their object. And you can do this too. You can put it at the end in a picture. It doesn't count towards the three pages and their museum label. So your museum label is kind of a separate thing. It's a quick little paragraph that tells us about the object. And then your paper tells us about why this object matters and kind of links it to some other st uh, studies or information. You can cite the textbook in this first paper. That's totally fine. I have no problem with that. You can also cite it in the second paper. Um, but that sample paper is quite useful. As for finding an object, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I've given you a, a quite a few resources here. Good uh, museum digital collections. Um, there's a huge list of them here. Um, really a, a ton of them. Big portals and then also uh, history museums listed here. Um, online exhibits listed here. Some of these are more useful than others for us as a pre-modern course. Another thing you'll probably want to look at is a list of museums like this one. Here's something Wikipedia is good for. Um, Wikipedia is good for many things actually, but these are a lot of national museums and a lot of them are online. Not all of them, but dozens of online national museums listed here. And you could also just search for the National Museum of XYZ Place, the National Museum of Japan, for example. Uh, and it'll come right up. The British Museum has a really great online collection, as does the Met. Um, and the Met in particular has an excellent set of essays that go with some of its objects. So the Met is almost like a fast lane to getting your first paper done because these uh, essays, let's look at Africans in ancient Greek art, the very first one here. It comes with an essay that's built right in that you can cite. This one was written by, written by Colette Hemingway um, and uh, maybe she's related to Sean Hemingway uh, and they wrote it together, I guess. And all of these essays on the Met are vetted by the Met itself, which I consider to be a scholarly source. I, I trust the Met to be scholarly in their treating of these objects and the history of them. So you can then uh, read this article, you could cite this article, cite the textbook, and then pick out one of these works of art to use. Let's click this one, and we get uh, some basic information to help you with making your label, and then any extra information they have about it. So here we go. They already have a wonderful piece of information here. You could kind of boil this down into your shorter label, uh, write your paper based on what's in our textbook and what you find here online uh, and on the Met. And the Met has these articles for every single part of the world, not just uh, Greece and Rome, but this Hellbrun timeline of art history is particularly useful. Um, and uh, most of these museums have something like this. So these are all really good. The Met in particular is amazing. Some objects are harder to study than others. The Smithsonian, for example, has a lot of objects. Let's click this cat, this mummified cat's head. They don't have a lot of information about it. Um, so you would then have to do a bit more research 
You'd have to have a bit more information than you get here to write your paper. You'd have to probably do some research on cats in Egypt and, and draw those links yourself. That's completely doable. It's I'm sure you can do it. And you could use our textbook for background information and then probably find one article about cats. And then you'd be in cats in Egypt, not just general. Uh, and you'd be off and running to use this mummified cat if you want to do that, for example. And I'm clicking these randomly. But um, some objects you're going to have built in quite a bit of information. And you probably just use the textbook and the built in information in that essay, for example, on the Met. Um, others, you're going to want to do a little bit more research yourself. But these are a lot of good links, and this is already online for you to look at, so you can just go through and click these links yourself. How about what should I write about? Um, and as I said at the beginning, the biggest question, the main question you should always try to answer is who cares? This is a question that can be very difficult to answer for some, some uh, things and some people. Historians often have trouble with it, even uh, you know, professional historians, graduate students. It's often the thing a graduate student struggles the most with, is coming up with an answer to the who cares question. Because as a grad student, you're studying some of the most random uh, corners of history available because they're unknown. That's what the grad student is really doing is when you're getting a PhD, you're usually studying something new, which means in history, often something obscure or something uh, relatively unknown. And things are often obscure and unknown because no one has found a way or a reason to care about them yet. So you have to find an argument that makes this thing important. That's your best answer. This object matters because. Feel free to put that in your paper. You know, this mummified cat's head matters because you could go ahead and put that right in your introduction. I have no problem with you being that direct. That's a good thing to do. Um, and so feel free to, to make an argument right from the beginning. This object matters because it d demonstrates X, Y, Z about this period of history or even connects to the modern world in some way. Um, I was reading just a little bit about Mayan ruins in my my research for this uh, for this lecture today, for putting these slides together, I was I was looking through the databases, and there was an entire article. I think it might have been a book chapter about how the Mayan ruins are creating a kind of cycle of culture, wherein people of Mayan descent, people who are uh, modern day. Uh, Mayans essentially are identifying more with their classical culture and learning more about it because of the tourism industry that drives interest externally in Mayan ruins. And so this is one way in which the Mayan ruins shift culture today, even though they're thousands of years old uh, in, in many cases. But so your, your argument should relate to, you know, why we care about this object historically, or maybe why we care about this object today. Those are two, two big lanes that you could go down. Uh, and remember, for this paper, you have two big jobs, right? For Blackboard and for the uh, what was going to be your presentation, uh, but now it'll just be me kind of going through some of the objects in a lecture, um, you're going to write up that short museum label, which you can look at at the very end of that sample paper. That tells us what your object is. What is this thing? And then your paper itself which tells us why your object matters, okay? And those are two different things. The label doesn't have to tell us why the object matters. It just has to tell, tell us what it is. Um, and, and what makes a good research paper? We've kind of covered this. Quality external sources, no Wikipedia once again. Feel free to not tell me about it and use Wikipedia to find information, but then you should be citing the information you find through Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia often has wonderful sources at the bottom that are highly credible. Now, I'm not saying everything on Wikipedia isn't to be trusted. I'm saying that as a professional scholar, I trust the sources more than the, on, the anonymous article. And also that I don't really use encyclopedias as a source anyway when I'm doing my writing, whether it's Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia. The purpose of that uh, medium, that kind of information it's, it's like a database of information, is to give you that surface level stuff, and then you go get the details from its sources. Um, it's okay to use a textbook. 
Um, as I say here, the best object papers are probably going to use at least one external source, either something like one of those MET articles or maybe one peer-reviewed article. It doesn't have to be a super long one. Um, and then also, what's the difference between an acceptable and unacceptable web source? I find students have a lot of trouble with this. I'm going to give you two examples here. The METS article on classical Cyprus, this is a good source because it comes from a reputable site, the MET. Uh, we trust the MET. Um, unacceptable source, here we have someone's blog, and I'm not trying to trash this person's blog, but this is one person's personal blog about Cyprus art and literature, and they talk about Greek history, and they may be 100% right, but you're not going to use this as a scholarly source because we don't know who this person is. We don't know their background. They're not citing sources here. Uh, so this is basically just one person's opinion of Cyprus, whereas here we have at least an expert, an entire art department supporting what is being put out by the Met. And this is similar to the process of peer review. Um, so the information should be vetted, essentially. It shouldn't just be a random website, a random blog uh, that you find, a random Tumblr page. Regardless of how good that page may be, you shouldn't use it unless it's a vetted source for this class. And this probably goes for all of your classes in college. How do you get a good score? Uh, some of the best things to do to boost your score, because you're not going to submit a rough draft, rough draft to me. You're submitting the final copy. You might want to trade papers with a peer in the class, and I might make that uh, make a little part of the discussion board for that, where you could uh, say, hey, does anybody want to read my paper? It's about this. I'm happy to read your paper, too. And then you could exchange papers. That's a good idea. And you should definitely adhere to our writing standards for this course. And I have a rubric here that we can take a look at um, really briefly. The way I will score your papers is split into four sections. Your ideas and the best version of this is on the left. The worst version is on the right. You have a central thesis that's clearly communicated, worth developing, and limited enough to be manageable. That's the best you can do. Uh, so I'll be 30 to 23 points. Uh, support, you should use evidence appropriately and effectively. Uh, you should uh, cite your sources where necessary. If you have no citations at all in your paper, you don't cite the textbook, you don't cite anything else, you don't cite the place you got your object, you're going to get a very low score on this. You're going to get a zero to six. If you have no, no sources whatsoever cited anywhere, uh, that's going to tank your grade. So you should cite your sources. It doesn't take much time to do, and way too many students these days don't do it. Um, organization and coherence. This is just kind of, does your paper have paragraphs that make sense? Is it organized in a way where ideas flow from one to the next? Um, and, and that's going to be something proofreading will help with. Um, and then style and mechanics. This is things like spelling, uh, grammar, uh, punctuation and word choice, just making sure that your, your English itself makes sense here. Um, and especially for these last two, for organization and coherence and style and mechanics, you can get some help from the LaGuardia Writing Center. The Writing Center is now going to be operating online uh, starting just a couple days ago. Exactly what they're doing isn't clear to me yet, but I believe you can just send them a message and they'll be able to look at your work and give you ideas, uh, give you some feedback. They're not necessarily going to completely proofread your rough draft for you, but they will generally look at parts of your writing to give you help. And they'll especially help you with these things, finding and narrowing a focus, working on an outline, developing effective paragraphs, using citations properly. So if you need help with that, get help from them. They will do that for you. Unfortunately, I have 60 students and I have to do two lectures a week and I have to grade all your stuff and I have to manage the discussion board. I can't read all your rough drafts. And so I'm not going to be able to read rough drafts for this course. You have to submit finished work to me. If you need help, the Writing Center is the best place to go. Um, and so uh, I really think you should use them if you have any concerns. Between peer review and the Writing Center, you should be able to knock out a very solid paper that will do very well for this course. If you still can't think of an object, 
Um, if you're just kind of stumped on what the heck do I do? How do I find something that I want to study? I don't care about any of this. Um, one thing I'm going to provide you is one set of past objects. But this is from an Asian history course. So it was a course that covered uh, all of Asia, meaning both South Asia, Central Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, all together. Um, and just give you the objects here without the explanations of what they are. And you can think about things you might want to look at. Now, some of them have a little bit of an explanation. Um, but you can think a little bit about what kinds of things interest you. Do you care about some of these things? Here we have some interesting art from Japan, the Korean hat, some modern art that's based on old school uh, Mongolian uh, imagery. Maybe not, this one maybe not quite appropriate for our class because I do want the object itself to be old in our case. The Great Wall of China. Uh, these are very interesting Korean coins. It's like a secret agent's coin. Um, some interesting old steles, old Buddhist uh, carvings into rock. These are called Haniwa. Anyway, keyhole tombs from Japan. Here's a, one of those big objects that doesn't fit. But you can look through this if you need inspiration. I think maybe that'll help. And I have that posted alongside this set of lecture slides in our lecture uh, folder. Um, and next week, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how to approach objects as historical sources. Because one of the reasons I'm letting you get away with, in my, in my opinion, uh, only maybe having one external source, is that your object itself is actually a source. It should be a source. And, and reading it, understanding it as an object, its material properties and its materiality is significant. And I'll give you one, uh, one article that you could look at a little bit that I find is very helpful in figuring out how to do an object paper. Um, it's if you want to look at it ahead of time or if you want to go ahead and search for it on the LaGuardia site, it's called Beyond Words by Leora Oslander. Um, and it is uh, something I'll probably also upload uh, after I get that lecture finished. Okay, so I'm going to keep this one short today, just giving you some advice on the object paper. Next week, we'll be going back to India. Um, you're going to be posting your, you should already, I think by the time this is up, have posted or be around the time you're posting your next set of discussion questions. This will be covering spirituality, polytheism, and monotheism. Also, it can, it can link to Persia, Greece, and Rome um, in general, because the, the shift from polytheism, thought, polytheism to monotheism is really about uh, these civilizations, these empires. Uh, your second short response on Greece, Rome, and the foundations of the West is also due on the 29th, um, and I will have that to you probably by the time this lecture is up, it will be available. And then next week, we'll be going back to India, uh, to the early state, and a little bit more on the Vedic tradition. We've talked a bit about that, but we might look at a little bit of uh, Vedic and Buddhist stuff, probably look at the Four Noble Truths, at least, and we'll keep going uh, into more and more towards uh, pre-modern history and out of ancient history as we continue. All right, uh, thanks a lot, everyone. I will see you next time.